Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. If you have your Bible, why don't you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're still talking about the church covenant. Thank God for the church covenant. And in your bulletin folder today, we have on the outside, more Christian worldview. We're talking about our Christian worldview that we find in the covenant. The covenant instructs us, you know, this is how we're going to live outside. This is the agreement we make with one another as believers here in this local assembly to live. And we began last week in that section with... Section 3, we also encourage family and personal devotions to religiously educate our children to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances. We've already done the first part of Section 4, to walk cautiously in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary, exemplary in our behavior. But today, we're going to look at this highlighted section and underlined section there in Section 4, to be Christ-like in all things, knowing that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, to live our lives in accordance with all the will of God is revealed through the life of Jesus Christ. And for this section, I wanted you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, because right there in 1 Corinthians 6, we have a statement that we find here in this portion of the covenant. And you know, if you just look right down um, to verse 19... Chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, verse 19, you'll find our phrase there. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? Oh, but let's read verse 22. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So you cannot read chapter 6 in 1 Corinthians without chapter 5. They go together, and really it's I looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I wanted to take a, take a piece of it, you know, and, and just look at a piece of it, but you really can't just look at a piece of it because there's so much. This is an argument that Paul began back in chapter 5 that he concludes at the end of chapter 6. So this statement that we have in our, catech- in our um, covenant and that we find here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is just one piece of a larger argument that he's making so... If you'll allow me, today I'd like to not just focus on one verse or two verses or a passage, but we're going to take an overview of the entire argument beginning in chapter 5 and going all the way through to the end of chapter 6. So we'll, we'll try to do this quickly and, and, uh, and succinctly as possible, as quickly and succinctly as possible. Let me read to you, though, to begin the message today, what Marshall Davis had to say. You know, I've been reading in his book, The Baptist Church Covenant, its history and meaning, and he's got a lot of good stuff in there. I would recommend it to you if you have um, a Kindle or if you have access to Amazon or Books a Million or any of those book buying services, you can go out and, and purchase this book. It's not very expensive, and it's an easy read. He says, this passage says our bodies are temples, of the Holy Spirit. And I'm quoting now, of course, Brother Davis. Misuse of sacred things is called sacrilege, whether it's the desecration of sacred church buildings, sacred ground cemeteries, sacred objects like crosses, to abuse or misuse them is sacrilege. So is the misuse or abuse of our bodies. It is not some minor issue or personal choice. Our own body and our own life and nobody else's business. It is sacrilege. We are not our own. Our bodies are not our own. We need to act like it. Treat our bodies as we would a sacred temple. Treat it as the physical body of Christ, that precious body which bled and died for us. End quote. Wonderful. And we have that argument for us pinned perfectly here in 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6. So, let's begin there. I'm sure that you know 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is that chapter where Paul's dealing with judgment in the church. And just look over 
we have a very serious thing happening in the church. A man has taken his father's wife to be his own. And the church seems to be very happy about it. You notice there in verse 6, Paul says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump. Paul's calling for the church to get rid of this man who's taken his father's wife to be his own. So judgment begins in the house of God, or at least it should. And Paul's upset with the Corinthian church that they've not done something about this. So Paul tells the church to put the man out that, say, that has taken his father's wife. They're to exercise judgment. But the church is not interested in exercising judgment because they're proud of it. They're glorying over it. Look how tolerant we are, they're saying, that this man should have his father's wife and still be in fellowship with us. Paul says of that, it's sin, it's leaven. By the way, leaven is never a good thing in the Bible. It's leaven. It eats its way into the rest of the church. Paul says, purge it out, get rid of it. Lest you be leavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. There it is. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, or for then you must needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat." You see, Paul is saying to those people, if you're in Christ and you're in covenant with the church and you do this sin and you're unrepentant, out. You cannot allow that sin to remain in the church. It has to be purged. And so he's telling the church, get rid of them, do your act of judgment, take the man out of fellowship. And the church is like, we don't want to do that. Look how tolerant we are. Look how what loving we are. So Paul begins now his argument. He's, he begins by saying, For what have I do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Then verse 1 of chapter 6. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? So now they're unwilling to judge the man who's committed this sin, the sexual sin against himself and as a witness against the church, and the church is not willing to get rid of him. So he begins talking about judgment. Don't, don't, you don't go to law against one another. You don't go to a, a, you know, a corrupt judge or a Gentile judge. You, as the church, need to take care of that. You can judge between one another. Settle your own disputes. And he begins by, uh, it actually continues because we had one of these over here in chapter 5, these know ye nots. I want you to keep track of the know ye nots in this passage. We have one there in chapter 5, verse 6, know ye not that this leaven will leaven the whole lump. And then we have it again recurring here in verse 2, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world. Paul begins his know ye not statements in chapter 6 right here. He's talking about judgment. You need to be judging the sin. Get rid of it. Purge it out. Oh, but you won't do that. Well, don't you judge between one another? Don't you help to settle disputes? You don't go to law against each other, do you? Now, let's imagine that for a moment. What would happen if two people in this congregation had a dispute and one sued the other? What would that do to fellowship? If it wasn't resolved, I guarantee you what would happen. Two sides would form. Actually, three sides would form. You'd have the side for the one fellow, the side for the other fellow, and the side of the people who just don't care, right? So there would be three factions within the church, and they would be fighting. Would that create fellowship and unity? Oh, no. I can't even imagine. That's a, that horrifies me to even think about that, to have two brothers in the church going to court to settle something like that. You see... What should happen in the church is, if two brothers have a dispute about something, then it's time for the church to sit down with those brothers and say, let's work this out. 
in Christ. Let's work this out. Let the elders of the church come in. Sit down those two brothers and say, we're not going to allow this to create disunity because that's most important. So Paul's telling the church, don't you know that, first thing he says, the saints will judge the world. And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Oh, look at that. The smallest matters. You see, what when I have a, a, a disputation with a brother here in the church and he's done me wrong or I've done him wrong and we're going to sue each other. I don't think it's a small matter, do I? But Paul says here, oh, these are just small matters compared to what you're going to judge. You're going to judge the world. So if you can't take care of the things in the church, time to take care of some matters in the church. You're not going to judge the man who's in sin, open rebellion, And walking around in the church like it's okay? You're not going to take care of the dispute between brothers? You're not going to judge that and and let them actually go to court against each other and destroy unity within the fellowship? You're not going to take care of that? Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And then we have in verse 3 another, know ye not. Look there in verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So judgment, ladies and gentlemen, it's our job. Now, we're not to be judgmental. Jesus takes care of that in Matthew chapter 7. He teaches us all about judgmentalism, but we are to judge. And we have that right here from the apostles. So, if you're not going to judge the sin issue, are you going to judge the issue of fellowship and unity? You need to judge that too. So, he moves on in his argument. Notice there in verse, uh, let's see. We're now, look at verse 4. If then you have judgments of the things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I like that. Least esteemed. So the least one of us should be able to handle those matters. I speak to your shame. Oh, Paul's Paul's really coming at him here. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? You see, that's our job. Paul says that's the job of the church. You need, to be, you need to judge the one that's an open sin and rebellion, and you need to judge between brothers who are at odds with one another to keep the unity in the fellowship. Judge the sin to purge out the leaven. Judge the disunity so that unity will reign. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Mm. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, Because ye go to law one with another, why do you not rather take wrong? Oh, here you go. Why not take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. May God help us if that ever happens. Why not take wrong? Oh, we get so, we get our little cockles up on the back of our neck, don't we? We get so hurt, so wronged. Well, how come you can't just take it? How come you just can't say, okay, that's okay. God, you know, Jesus forgave me. I forgive you. I I have have no right to complain. Why not just take it? Take the wrong. Just let it go. See, but no, we got to go to law against one another. There is utterly a fault among you because you go to law. Why do you do this? Why not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that's your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous, here's another know ye not statement. Know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now I want you to look very closely here at verses 9 through um, nine through 11. Because what we have here is this difference between the unrighteous and the justified. Notice verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I have a question about this list. The unrighteous are detailed here, but with a list like this, which we didn't really need, do we really need this? Do we really need him to tell us about the unrighteous? Oh, no, we don't really need that. We, we can open up our Sunday paper and, and make a new list for Paul. You know, we don't need this list. And, by the way, this list is not comprehensive. 
I mean, look at, for example, the list uh, of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. In that list, Paul gives us 19 items that are the works of the flesh. So this is not a comprehensive list. Why in the world give it to us? Or, for example, go to the Ten Commandments. You know, he doesn't have all the Ten Commandments listed here either. Why not give us part of that list as well? So he gives us this incomplete list of unrighteous deeds. And I want you to notice that at the beginning and at the end here, we have the kingdom of God mentioned. Notice verse 10. Uh, or I'm sorry, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he ends that uh, in verse 10 by saying, inherit the kingdom of God. So we understand that, don't we? There is no inheritance for the unrighteous. And these things are what the unrighteous people do. So Paul sets us up here. We got it, Paul. We know this. We understand these things. But then notice what he says there in verse 11. And such were some of you. Oh, that's right. Were. That's the important word there. Past tense verb. I was. Amen, I was. That's right, I was. I was this. I was all of these things. But not now. Notice what he says there in 11. But ye are, you're washed. You're sanctified. Woo! You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Does that say anything about what David Smith did? No, because David Smith did nothing. Jesus did it all. He paid it all. His blood avails. He cleansed me from sin. All of it. Such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And I want you to notice, too, the artistic way in which Paul puts this together. Notice the list in verse 9 and 10. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, feminine, blah, 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 blah. He gives us nor this, nor that, nor the other. And then in 11, he says, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. What a beautiful list that is. And it's true of the church. The difference between the righteous and the unrighteous, the justified and the unrighteous, right here. Right here in three verses, he gives it to us straight. So, moving on, he kind of sets us up there, but we'll let Paul deliver the punch here in just a minute. Notice verse 12. All things are lawful unto me. Now, who is me? Me is that justified man who's been washed, sanctified, and justified. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Just because I can, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't mean I should. Mom, 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 everybody's gone down to the Second Street Bridge and is jumping off. Can I go? Well, sure, honey. If everybody's going down there to jump off, go ahead, have fun with your friends. What happens when I jump off? I might be having fun with my friends on the bridge. I might be having fun with my friends off the bridge. I might be having fun with my friends when I get down to the middle of the drop. I might be having fun with my friends until I hear them scream as they hit the water. And then I might not have fun anymore. But guess what? By then, gravity's doing its job. And I'm going to go... And they're not going to find me anymore because the Second Street Bridge that crosses over between Louisville, Kentucky and New Albany, Indiana is at a very precarious place in the Ohio River. And everybody who's jumped from the Second Street Bridge has never been found. I don't know where they go. Nobody knows where they go. But that is a weird place in the river. But it's okay, right? It's lawful for me. Oh, sure. If everybody's doing it, go right ahead. Do it, but is it good for me? Yeah, just because I can doesn't mean I should. And notice Paul's language here. He's talking to believers, and at the end of 12, he says something very important, believer. Some things have a power to bind. Notice that. I will not be brought under the power of any. 
the power of any. It doesn't mean the loss of salvation. It doesn't mean the loss of justification. It doesn't mean the loss of sanctification. It doesn't mean that loss. But it does mean the loss of freedom. That's what addiction does. And there are many Christians who have engaged in things that they could engage in. The same things they were saved out of, i.e. the list that Paul gave us in verses 9 and 10. And are today under a self-imposed curse. Because they, they did. They didn't have to. It wasn't good for them. And they fell under the power of the thing that they've been freed from. And so they walk about as a living contradiction. A man or a woman who has been brought under the power of the sin that they were released from by Jesus. Gone from it. And then they go back. And they dabble with it. And they piddle with it. And they put their lips to the bottle but they don't drink. And they do it again and again and again. And finally, they engage. And they're right back where they were except they're born again. But they've been brought back under the power of that thing that they were once released from. Notice that he goes on in 13 and he talks about appetites. Are very appropriate for this section, don't you think? Appetites are not the end of the matter. They are transient, just like the flesh. The belly, he says in 13. The meat is for the belly and the belly for the meat. God made the belly to take care of the meat. And he made the meat for the belly. Thank you, Lord, for that. I like my ribs and steaks and chops and hamburgers and fish and chicken and turkeys. and Oh, I like all them meats. I like the breads that I eat and I like those sweet things that I eat. And God made my belly for the meats and the meats for the belly. And I'm rejoicing in that. But it's transient. Notice what he says there. God shall destroy both it and them. And sometimes my appetites get out of control. Sometimes my appetites for food gets out of control, right? Sometimes my appetites for entertainment get out of control. Sometimes my appetites for other things, darker and more demented, get out of control. And suddenly I'm brought into the power of those things. Paul says, I will not be brought into the power of any. Ladies and gentlemen, I think for some of us, maybe for all of us, yea, for the church in general in America, we need to say, I will not be brought under the power of any. It's time to walk away. And then he deals with the thing that I have not dealt with yet in this sermon. We have some tender ears here, so I want to be careful. But notice, sexual appetites are mentioned. Sexual appetites distort the true meaning of the body. Just as some things have the power to bind us, the Lord has the only power to raise us. And we can be freed from those things that keep us in check. And notice what he says there about the body. The end of verse 13, the beginning of 14. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. You notice that word power there. We had that word power up there in verse 12. I will not be brought under the power of any. So what happens for the believer who's under the power of something that has bound them back to a sin or to a habit or to a thought or to something that they were released from before? The resurrection of Christ. That is the only power that can release the believer today. And thank God we have that opportunity. The body is not for fornication. But for the Lord. Do you see how Paul is now starting to work back to the argument that, oh, we don't want to get rid of that, brother. Look how tolerant we are. He's taken his father's wife, and we're okay with that. We're allowing grace to reign in our church. Paul says, no, no, that's sin. You need to get rid of it. If he's unrepentant, excise the sin. Get out, get it out. Right now, hurry. So he started this argument about judgment, and now he comes all the way back around now to this sin of sexual immorality, fornication, that's happening in their church. And they're okay with it. The body's not for fornication. Guess who the body's for? (laughs) The Lord Jesus. That's who the body's for. Let's give him our bodies. The Lord is for the body. 
And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. That is, he has power over physical bodies just like he has power over everything else. And then notice we end this chapter with three know ye nots right in a row. And Paul comes hard. He comes really hard at these people. And he comes hard at us. And we need this. We need him to come hard at us like this. Verse 15. Know ye not. Here's another know ye not. Three know ye nots in a row. Starting with verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the member of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Notice members of Christ in verse 15. Members of Christ in the second phrase. Members of an harlot in the third phrase. Paul comes really after these folks. Stay away from physical fornication. Stay away from idolatry with your body. Stay away from adultery with your body. Stay away from it. Don't let it take root. This is why we have such a statement in the church covenant. This is why. Never to repeat again the tragedy of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Never to allow that kind of sin to take root in the church. You see, because he set us up there in verses 9 and 10, this is what you were. You were fornicators. Notice that's the first thing he mentions. You were adulterers. You were idolaters. You were all these things. That does not become you now as a Christian. You're not those things now. You're not to participate in those things now. You're not to be in that stuff now because that will do nothing but bring you under the power of it. And Paul says, I won't be under the power of any of it. Thank God there's a hope. There's hope in resurrection. There's hope in the resurrection power of God for us right now. We can be released from it if we call on him. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the member of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. Here's the second Know ye not. What? Look how strong he gets here with this. Look at how strong he gets with it. What? You mean you don't know? That which is joined to an harlot is one body. For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You see, it's inconsistent for the church to say, oh, it's okay to sin sexually. And then say, oh, I'm a member of the body of Christ. How does that work? What kind of hypocrisy is that? That's dark. That's dank. That's distressing. God forbid that we should ever get there. God forbid that we should ever say to our membership, oh, it's okay. It's okay. No, it's not okay. Mm. And then the third, know ye not, right there in verse 19. Know ye not. Well, he goes, What? Again, he has the what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. Here it is. There's our statement in 19. This destroys the argument that it's your body, your decision, doesn't it? Pro-choice community, or the, yeah, pro-choice, pro-choice community. The abortionists, they love that. Oh, it's my body, it's my decision. I'll control my own body. You're not going to control nothing. Give it to Jesus. It's his anyway. It belongs to him. Apparently, if you're in Christ, it's not your decision. Apparently, if you're in Christ, it's not your body. I can't make decisions for this by myself. It's not mine to do so with. Ultimately, he's completely in charge. And, by the way, he's housed in me, his very spirit, so that I've now become not just a body, but I've become the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's in me. I have him. I am not my own. I am bought with a price. And if you're bought, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have ownership. And then we have this invitation. Here it is, right here. Paul brings it all together. He started in five, and now he comes all the way back around to that problem that they've got by allowing that man to stay in the church. And he says, therefore... Glorify God in your bodies. And nobody in that Corinthian church could say that that man who had his father's wife was glorifying God with his body. Not a one. So the question is for all of us, what are we doing to glorify God with our bodies? Are we under the power of any? Let me tell you something, friends. Whether you're lost today and you don't know Jesus or whether you're saved, you can be freed 
from that thing that binds you. Because there's power available. Oh, didn't you know that? Know ye not? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.